So here we go. Um, today, uh, lecture two out of 40, uh, we're looking at uh, Eden and the eschaton and the temple. The eschaton just means the end, end of the Bible, the, what the Bible says about the end. And as always, uh, thank you for taking the attendance quiz uh, number two in bright space. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about how is the temple like or unlike the Garden of Eden. If you're coming to the Old Testament and you want to understand what the Old Testament is about, this is a key question. Uh, how is the temple related to the Garden of Eden? And I pointed out last time that the Garden of Eden has gold, bdellium, and onyx, and the temple tabernacle has gold, bdellium, and onyx. Uh, the Garden of Eden has cherubs. The temple has cherubs. The Garden of Eden has the immediate uh, presence of God uh, interacting uh, with his people. The temple has interaction with God. And so we're going to look today how is the Garden of Eden and the temple connected. And once we understand that, we're going to be able to step back and look at the whole Bible and see that that theme of getting people back to the Garden of Pleasure, that is central to what uh, the meta narrative is about. How uh, is the tabernacle, the small version, and then the temple, the larger uh, version? And there, then we're going to talk about something really weird in the text. And that is when God creates woman, um, he doesn't fashion her out of dirt the way that he does the man. Rather, he takes some of the man's essence and he house builds the woman. And we're going to um, ask, why is that? And we're also going to ask the question, um, that house building is also used of God building the temple. And so how is uh, the woman Eve uh, connected to this temple? Uh, uh, what, what's going on there? And we're going to see that in the New Testament, the church, this same exact word, oikodemeo in Greek, is being house built as a new Eve. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but the Bible starts with a cosmic wedding of this uh, power couple who are going to be God's co-rulers in uh, the cosmos. And it ends with a new power couple of the God-man and this new, um, uh, this new eschatological uh, bride Eve. So when you're trying to understand what the whole Bible is about, um, to, to understand the temple and to get your bearings uh, is, is just crucial uh, in terms of understanding what uh, is being presented. And then we're going to see the idea of Jesus as the new temple and Jesus creating the new Eve as his new true Temple. So that's what we're going to do today, looking at uh, this idea of the tabernacle temple in the Old Testament and how we put it together in a whole Bible, biblical uh, theology. And so uh, let's start with uh, this description. And if you read, if you're able to do the homework, uh, you read about the tabernacle and one of the key things about the tabernacle is there is a separation between the holy place and the holy of holies. And this is an artistic representation of that. And if you were able to kind of conceive of that in your mind, you realize that on that veil are cherubs. Now, when we dive into the story, you realize that if you're looking at the veil, and you're looking at cherubs, you're standing in the position 
that Adam and Eve would have been as they're being exiled from Eden. That is, there's a veil, there's a separation between them and God. And the entities that are keeping them out of the Garden of Eden are these cherubs. And we don't know as much as we would like uh, to know about what cherubs are. We know that they have one uh, order from God, and that is to keep sinners out of the garden of pleasure. And so as we look at this veil in the temple, and we think about that, the idea that God wants us uh, to have in mind is that we're excluded from this garden of pleasure, this uh, place of immediate fellowship with God and the thing uh, that is excluding us are these guardian angel cherubs. And if we do a whole Bible biblical theology, cherubs are really strange in terms of how they're described because they're described as having uh, four wings and uh, that the wings have eyes in them so that they can see uh, in every direction. We're told that from the torso down, they're uh, uh, created like animals. They look like animals. And then we're told that they have four faces. Uh, one is a face of a man, a face of a lion, a face of an eagle, and a face of a cow. Uh, or an, an ox. And so you look at that and you begin to think about what these creatures would, would be like, and it's terrifying. Um, perhaps you would look at the these angelic, terrifying uh, cherub creatures, and perhaps you would see the face of a man, and uh, perhaps that would be a little more comforting. If you saw the face of a lion, it would be terrifying, but if you were looking at cherubs and you were seeing the veil, you were realizing there's a separation between me and God. Uh, I can't get back to that garden of pleasure and what's keeping me out are these creatures. Now, when you read that in the Old Testament reading, I hope that you ask yourself the question, why? Why are these here? Why are people excluded from the Garden of Pleasure? Um, what, what is this about? Why did God do all this this way? And we're told if we uh, read through the whole Bible, we would be told that on a certain day, in fact, it's the 10th day of the first month, some people think that maybe the anniversary of when uh, Adam fell, Adam and Eve fell and were kicked out of the garden, that on the 10th day of the first month, that then and only then can the high priest come into the holy place and what he's to do on the Yom Kippur, uh, Yom Kippur uh, uh, is to place blood between the cherubs. Now, uh, I kind of prefer this picture, and I want you to imagine if you were looking at that and you saw a puddle of blood between two cherubs, what would it look like had happened? You're just standing there. You're seeing these terrifying creatures. You know that they've been commanded to keep sinners out of the Garden of Eden, you're looking at these terrifying creatures and what you see on the ground between those creatures is blood. What would it look like had happened? Would it not look like someone had tried to enter Eden and had been slaughtered? That's even more terrifying, isn't it? That's what's at the center of the Holy of Holies. And here's the strange thing. When we try to understand the meta-narrative of the whole Bible and this Ark of the Covenant is somehow 
uh, central to understanding that meta narrative. At the center of everything looks like someone had died trying to go back into the Garden of Eden. And it's even complicated because God says over and over to Israel, I'll meet you between the cherubs. And I don't know about you, but I know my own heart, and I know that I sin every day in thought, word, and deed. And if these cherubs are given the commands with a, a flaming uh, sword to slaughter anyone who tries to go back into the Garden of Eden, knowing my own heart and knowing that I sin every day in thought, word, and deed, I'm terrified if I'm looking at the cherubs because if I'm a sinner, the cherubs have been given the command to exclude me on penalty of death from the Garden of Eden. So how does all this fit in with a whole Bible biblical theology? Well, when you're thinking about the story and you're thinking about how to put all the stories in the Bible together, you realize that Adam and Eve being kicked out of the Garden of Eden is an exile from the presence of God. And that exile happens over and over and over again. Uh, when God gave the law to Moses, the stipulation was if, if you follow the law, you get to stay in the land flowing with milk and honey. But if you uh, violate the law, then the land is going to vomit you out. It's going to exile you. And over and over and over, no matter how good the promises are, uh, that God makes, people choose to sin rather than to follow God, and they're excluded. And so this meta narrative of being excluded from the Garden of Pleasure happens over and over and over again in Scripture. It's first with Adam and Eve. But the meta narrative, God's meta narrative, is so beautiful because. As God is kicking them out of the Garden of Eden, it says that he clothed them with garments of skin, and uh, meaning that he killed an innocent animal. Um, he shed the blood of an innocent animal and took the skin and made royal robes. In fact, in Hebrew, it's the same word of Joseph's coat of many colors. It's this... Uh, uh, clothing uh, of honor, as he's kicking them out, he's giving them this great hope of somehow uh, he's showing them grace at the same time. When we come to the New Testament, it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And this word, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, it just so happens that in Greek, it's the word in duo, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word in duo is the exact same word, the exact same word that's used of God in duoing Adam and Eve with this sacrifice. And so when you uh, see this couple, uh, naked couple, and they're being exiled from the presence of God, the first thing that God does is he clothes them with royal robes. And in the meta narrative, uh, ultimately, this one God of monotheism who exists as three persons uh, in some kind of unexplained way, this one God of monotheism to get people back to the garden of pleasure, Jesus is going to come. He's going to die. He's going to be that Passover lamb and we're going to be clothed with his righteousness because God intends to take us back to the garden of pleasure. And so he's hinting at that story as he clothes this first couple in this sacrifice of grace. Um, so when you think of the tabernacle and you think of the cherubs and you think of the exclusion from the presence of God, 
connect the tabernacle temple with the idea of the Garden of Eden and realize that in the meta narrative that it's God's purpose of creating a way to get us back to that Garden of Pleasure. If you want to think about it like this, the story of the Bible is the story of exile from the Garden of Eden to the place where um, the people are in the restored Garden of Eden. But here's the problem. To exist with God at peace, you have to be the kind of person who wants to be like God is, holy. And you you have to be a person who uh, not only wants to obey God, but who does obey God. If Over and over, it's always the story. If you don't obey God, you get kicked out. And in the New Testament, if you're cowardly, if you're an adulterer, if you practice magic, the you, you're kicked out of this heavenly Jerusalem. And so to be at peace with God, you've got to be the kind of person who wants to live a life that God wants you to live. And so the story is, how do you get back? How, how do you create a people who will uh, be willing to do it God's way? And what God wanted in the Garden of Eden was these two people, and he wanted these two people to live in the Garden of Pleasure. He gave them everything. Uh, he gave them the ability to procreate and even commanded them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with offspring. Uh, enjoy this Garden of Pleasure. Uh, taste every tree, but I've got a law, and I, I want you not to do this one thing, but everything else. Enjoy, enjoy to the full. And what he wanted was for a couple who, in love with him and in love with each other, would be fruitful, multiply, and produce godly offspring. But man, our ultimate uh, forefather, Adam, could not resist violating God's law. And when he did that, uh, he drove a wedge between himself and his wife. Uh, uh, he introduced a fallenness to all his natural offspring. And the result is they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. So the question is, how do you get back to this place where you've got this couple who will love each other and love God enough to live at peace with God forever? And the story of the Bible is the story of the new covenant where God says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You had a stone heart that was just bent on evil. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away that stone heart. I'm going to give you a real heart. I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to do something that is so oriented toward winning your heart that ultimately you're going to become the kind of person who cannot sin, who is so in love with God that not only do they want to obey God's law, they can obey God's law. And so the story of the Bible is the story of God implementing that so that these people can come back to the uh, restored Garden of Eden and his extraordinary act that would win fully the heart of his wife is that the one God of monotheism in the person of the Lord Jesus incarnates, lives under his own law, never sins once in thought, word, or deed. And then as the new Adam takes uh, the sin of uh, his people to himself, allows himself to be murdered, and then by being murdered, he unmurders all those who would ever come to him by faith. And in unmurdering those people, he gives them a new heart, a heart that wants to do it God's way. And then uh, uh, as, as they walk with him and as they live by faith, eventually that desire, when they see Jesus in heaven, becomes ability. And they become the kind of people who will never, ever 
sin again, and because that's what they're like, they get to live with God in holiness forever. That's the meta narrative of Scripture. That's how the pieces uh, fit together. God promises in the new covenant, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my ways. You will live in the land that I gave your forefathers. And what land ultimately is that? It's the Garden of Eden. You will be my people and I will be your God. That's what God promises in the new covenant. And Jesus, uh, as he was dying on the cross the night before, he says of the Lord's Supper, this is the new covenant in my blood. What I'm doing is fixing it so that the new covenant can be yours. That's what we're to think about when we're uh, thinking about this tabernacle temple. And recall that as soon as Jesus dies on the cross, what does it say happened in the temple? It says the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The cherubs had been taken out of the way. The access to the garden of pleasure was there for any person who would ever come to him by faith. That's what the meta narrative is about. So when you think about the tabernacle and you think of all these cherubs, gold, bedellium, onyx, uh, you think about this uh, uh, altar where the fire never goes out, that uh, that stands between you and and the uh, coming back into the garden of pleasure. What God wants you to think about is the meta narrative of Scripture of being exiled, justly exiled uh, from the Garden of Eden and then being brought back in by a priest. Now, um, just to kind of point out how beautiful the details of this story uh, is, I want to look at what this word ark means. When it says Ark of the Covenant, uh, what does it mean? And uh, in particular, um, since inside the Ark of the Covenant, uh, there's a jar full of uh, manna, the bread from heaven. There's a, a stick that was dead and came back to life. And then there's a copy of the Ten Commandments. Why in the world uh, the bread from heaven, something that was dead, that came back to life, and a copy of God's law? Why in the world is that there? Well, if you want to know what any uh, word means, uh, the easiest way is to go to the a place where the word appears and uh, to ask yourself in the original language, uh, what uh, what does that word mean? Where is it used elsewhere? And um, you can find that on the internet. I have to have a, a computer program. I can right click on this word and I can tell, say, uh, where in the Bible does this word appear? And it will pull up the hundreds of times the word appears. And what's interesting about this word in the Hebrew, achron, uh, is that you see that the majority of times in Scripture, it's translated Ark of the Covenant. But the very first place that this word, achron, appears, you see is Genesis 50, uh, 26. And that's the last verse in um the book of Genesis, and I hope that you have a Bible with you today. I hope you'll bring a Bible to this class because I want you to look up the last word in the book of Genesis, uh, the last sentence, and it will tell you uh, what this word ahron in Hebrew means when you hear this Ark of the Covenant. And if you turn to... Uh, Genesis and uh, turn to the last chapter, chapter 50, and then 
uh, turn to the very last verse. This is what that verse says. Uh, so Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and they put him in a coffin in Egypt. Now, where in the world in that sentence does the word ark appear? In Hebrew, it's right here. Uh, this word means in, and in Hebrew, you put that at the front of the word. So this is the word in. So what is the word ark in Hebrew? It's coffin. The word achron is coffin. So here's my question. Why in the world? would you have at the center of the Holy of Holies a gold-covered co coffin? Why would you have blood on the top of a gold-covered coffin? I imagine there are some in here, uh, imagine most of you uh, like movies, uh, like a good movie. I, I love a good movie. Um, I love movies like M. Night Shyamalan, particularly the early M. Night Shyamalan, where just there's so much meaning in every detail and you watch it and then you realize what the story is about and you re-watch it and you look for details. The Bible is just like that. God is a better movie director than M. Not Shyamalan. And he's put meaning, meta narrative meaning, plot symmetrical meaning in everything that happens in Scripture. So, why is the center? a little coffin with blood on the top. Blood and two cherubs. Why in the world would this looking like someone had tried to re-enter Eden and were slaughtered by these guardian cherubs, why would that be at the center of the tabernacle? you ever read this story? John's the only one who tells us this detail. You tell me if you find something interesting in this story. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene. Oh, and by the way, as we read this story, remember that in the Old Testament, women could not go into the tabernacle. Women were excluded from the Holy of Holies. On the first day of the week, and it, so we read this story, remember that Peter and John don't get to see what Mary Magdalene saw. But let's read it. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb, and while it was still dark, uh, and she saw the stone had already been taken away from the tomb, so she ran came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. John's the only one who tells us these details. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. So uh, Peter and John run, they stick their head in the tomb they see the grave clothes, the bloody grave clothes there on the ground. They see the uh, covering of Jesus' face, and they realize that Jesus has been written, raised from the dead, and they leave. They, they realize that Jesus is alive, but they don't see Jesus. Mary comes back. John's the only one to tell us this detail. 
Mary comes back and she's crying her eyes out and she stoops to look in the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting on either side of the place where the body of Jesus had laid. Now, just think with me here. If you wrap up a bloody body in linen and you lay that out, what's going to happen to those linen grave clothes as that dead body lays there? Two angels there. Blood between two angels. Have you seen that somewhere else in the story? Now, who's seeing this? Is this a man who's seeing this? Or is this a woman who's seeing this? And is this like a paragon of virtue woman? Or is this a woman with issues? Is this somebody who had sinned? And these two angels don't kill Mary Magdalene. They speak to her. Woman, why are you crying? John doesn't see this. Peter doesn't see this. Mary Magdalene sees this. Now I want you just to picture what that looked like. Jesus' body had lain on uh, a raised platform of stone. There was blood all over the place. Now there are two angels sitting on either side. Does that look like something else from the story to you? Then I love this. She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. So there are two angels, and maybe she saw the human-looking face of those angels. She doesn't realize what's going on. She goes out and there is God incarnate. She didn't know that it was Jesus. He said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And then I love the meta narrative uh, symbolism of this. Supposing him to be the gardener. Well, that's interesting. I know somebody else who went into a garden and turned it into a grave. Jesus entered a tomb and he threw open the gates of paradise. Supposing him to be the gardener, and if we had time to look up this word, uh, uh, kapos in Greek, guess what that word is used for in the Old Testament? It's used for the Garden of Eden. Supposing him to be the, the garden worker. She said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
He said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father. I ascend to my God and to your God. Jesus, as God incarnate, is becoming the new Adam, but he's not just the new Adam, he's the new priest who is able to get sinful people back to the garden of pleasure. And Mary is the first one who gets this vision. So when we think about the temple and the garden of Eden, and the cherubs, step back and ask yourself, how is all this related to the meta narrative of Scripture? And what Jesus is doing is creating a, a people who are uh, inherently sinful and who have problems and who can't follow God's law. He's taking people like that and he's turning them into men and women having been made perfect. He's winning the heart of his new Eve, the church, by taking her sins and uh, dying for them and then giving them a new heart. And then uh, when they see Jesus in heaven, complete transformation into people who want to obey God. A lot of people, when they come to the Old Testament story, will ask the question, well, why why didn't God make it uh, so that they couldn't sin? You know, why, why did he put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden in the first place? Why not make a people who just would never sin? And God is saying in the story, that's exactly what I'm doing. And how I'm doing it is by allowing people freely to rebel against me. I'm allowing people to sin. I knew they were going to sin. I knew that it was going to take Christ. I did it that way because that's how I can make a people who will freely choose to walk in my way. That's how I can win their will. It's a meta narrative. It's elegant. It's beautiful. And every single sentence of it is connected uh, to Jesus. So when you think of the Old Testament sacrifices, all that is. Uh, symbolic, uh, pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. Uh, this has the fire that never goes out. I wonder uh, if that isn't some kind of symbolism for hell and God's uh, uh, wrath against sin. Jesus, as God incarnate, took that wrath to himself and he suffered uh, the infinity of God's wrath against evil. In fact, multiple infinities, all, all the hells that all the people who would ever come uh, to God, uh, Jesus, uh, as the God-man, suffered infinitely uh, for that. And I don't know what this uh, labor is about, but I know that the priest wash their hands and feet in it. I don't know how that connects to the meta narrative, but I know that Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And I'm not sure what this is about, but I do know elsewhere there's a table that has bread and wine on it. I don't know what this is about, but it's made to throw its light forward on this table. And uh, if you take the time to look at the details uh, for the Jews, this is going to be connected with the revelation in the Old Testament, and it's throwing its light forward to this provision that God had made. So what I'm trying to 
uh, persuade you of is that when you think of the sacrificial system and the tabernacle temple, realize that if you connect that with Eden, it's going to help you understand the whole story. And in the short time we have left, I just want to dive into this thing about house building Eve. Now, in the Old Testament story, how does God make man? He makes him out of dirt. In fact, that's what the word Adam means. It means dirt. So God makes this dirt man. Uh, he somehow isn't alive, but then God emphusiaos him. God breathes into him uh, life. And uh, just in terms of the connection of this story, that emphusiaoing appears right here. It also appears when God emphusiaos the dead bodies and they come to life in Ezekiel 37. We're going to look at that together uh, shortly. But the last place this word emphusiao appears is in John 20. And in John 20, uh, the day that Jesus was risen from the dead, it says he appeared to his disciples. And after they talk and he shows the wounds, it says that he walked around the room and emphusiaoed his disciples. That's the same thing God did to make the dirt man a real man. Yahweh in the Old Testament emphusiaoes Adam and he becomes a living creature. Jesus emphusiaoes the disciples. And you can kind of see what's going on there that somehow Jesus' death is remaking the people of God. So the question is, why did God not make Eve out of dust and emphusiao Eve? Uh, some people would say that's somehow anti-woman. Uh, that's the wrong way to read the meta narrative. Look at what it says says, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. Uh, the Lord God fashioned a woman. Now, if we took the time to read this in Hebrew, this is the word that's used. It's the word bana, and it, it's the word everywhere that's used of building a house. It's also the word that's used of to build the temple of God. So uh, God creates the dirt man out of dirt, emphusiasm, him, he becomes a living soul. But when he reveals to the man that he needs a wife, he doesn't make a dirt woman breathe into her. Rather, he house builds her out of the essence of the dirt man. And in uh, Greek, when they translate this, they actually translate it literally. Uh, he oika demeod, he oikost, uh, that's the word house, and demeo is the word build. Uh, he house built the woman. And in the New Testament, does God house built anything else? Well, absolutely he does. You also, as living stones, are being oikademeod as a spiritual house, as a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This house building of the woman out of the essence is meant as a metanarratival, meant as a typological, meant as plot symmetry, meant as an elegant uh, revelation of God's plan A, always his plan A, of taking the human perfected essence of Jesus and turning that into a temple bride that God will live inside of forever. He oikodemeoed her. 
Therefore, encourage one another and oikodemeo one another, just as you are doing. In fact, every place the word edify appears in the New Testament, it's equal to that Greek word oikodemeo. Every single time it's used. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you house build a house for me to dwell in? You can't house build a house. I'm going to have to house build a house. The whole story of the Bible is a grand chiasm of God making that ultimate house of New Jerusalem. And we saw how uh, these temples grow over time. Very small tabernacle, bigger Solomon temple, uh, bigger uh, Ezekiel temple, and then uh, the ultimate cubic Holy of Holies we saw when John saw it was 1,380 miles uh, tall, wide, deep. This is a growing temple. Uh, ultimately, it's going to fill the whole universe. It's interesting uh, that that was what the man and his wife were created to do. Fill the whole earth. Subdue it. Rule over. Put all things under his uh, feet. The fullness of him who fills all. It's interesting to me that that... Um, temple was made out of thorn wood uh, but it doesn't burn up just like God got inside of thorns but the thorns didn't uh, uh, burn up God's making a temple out of thorns beautiful thorns and I love I mean talk about hidden uh, hints I mean have you seen something else in the Bible that looks like this, that has water coming out of here. Have you ever seen that before? You know, if, if you take it and do it this way, have you ever seen that before? Or, you know, all those times in the Old Testament when you have all those numbers and it's just mindless numbers. And it's like, what does that mean? Well, if you assigned a, a thing to each one of the numbers, guess what? This is the picture you get. Does that look like something to you? Have you seen that before? I hear people say, oh, if there were just more evidence that the Bible is God's word, if there was just more there, there are things on every page. Well, I see my time has run out. I'll see you on Friday.